to my phone too. Hi everybody, it's Dr. Sandy and I'm so excited about today. We have a couple webinars. This one is going to knock your socks off. I hope I have everybody's attention and I'm going to be inside and looking to see who's going to be saying things so you can ask Dr. Apri some questions that you have about the V word or actually we'll say um, about the, the vid. <laughs> I want to welcome you. This is another one of my family members from Hungry to Speak. This is Dr. Opri, and he is absolutely amazing. Like I just shared his uh, speech he did, I think it was today. And I just, I just love how everybody just has wonderful things to say, and especially you and having your degree and being on the front line. I had a connection from you. You didn't, you didn't even know. And it is so vital that you're here and I appreciate that you're you're here on board with us today and you got some awesome stuff to talk about like I am just like ah! I'm like so excited I'm normally not this goofy but I want yeah I am I'm not gonna lie I want to invite I want to welcome you to Nurses Against Violence Unite and Nurse Talk and Thank today you. we're going to I'm going to let you lead the way and I'm going to ask you questions here and there and I'm going to let you go. So thank you so much. You Oh, let me talk to you a little bit about Dr. Dr. Opri. Hold on a second. Um, he is an international speaker and author of 19 books, four books on COVID, nine on relationships, and latest book on COVID-19 remedies, a frontline doctor's view. Uh, he also has um, another uh, helping divorced healthcare professionals remarry confidently. Hey, guys, listen to that. Um, speak on COVID-19 early management, uh, post-vaccination corporate safety culture, how toxic relationships affect health, how toxic relationships kill businesses. Wow, this is so much on target with what we do with Nurses Against Violence and what I work on. So, um, and your expertise is you are board cert you are board certified internist, COVID-19 frontline doctor, medical doctor. Um, with early treatment and you also have expertise in mate selection and marriage compatibility and pathophysiology of divorce. Welcome. I'm going to turn Thank it you. over to you now, sir. Thank you, Sandy. So what we uh, were talking about was a kaleidoscopic view of COVID-19, not just a tunnel vision of vaccine only, but to look at the entire spectrum of what is going on and ask ourselves the right questions. You know, I've tried to accomplish so many things in life and anyone who has always gets to a bottleneck where even your coaches cannot help you if you have a coach. And sometimes your coaches will say, you gotta go in to yourself. And those of us who have this, not innate, but learned ability to go into ourselves, to drag ourselves out of our shells and separate ourselves from ourselves. In other words, who am I and what am I experiencing are two different things. Yeah. Who am I is gonna eventually prevail over whatever I'm experiencing right now. And in this case, we're experiencing COVID-19. Some family members refuse to get a vaccine and other family members have what treated them like garbage and dirt, only to turn around, get the shot and end up with a stroke. And guess what? The person who didn't get the shot is the one who is now taking care of them. Now, I'm saying this to say, regardless of whatever position you have on vaccines and vaccinations, I am not anti-vax. And it's only logical and self-preservatory to what to be hesitant about getting the shot. It's normal, ladies and gentlemen. When did it become abnormal to see something new and not want to be the first to take it or to not even want to take it, particularly when your next door neighbors 
three of them back to back suffered a stroke, Bell's palsy and a heart attack who had been fine before then. And they were in their thirties and forties. When did that become normal? It's insane. What are we saying here? Let's step back, let's think. AstraZeneca study, I just looked at that again yesterday, right? Where they had 269 people who developed cavernous sinus thrombosis and other kinds of thrombotic phenomena, clots in different parts of the sinuses in the brain. And they said, let's hold off on this thing, okay? But when it comes to Pfizer, I want you to understand Pfizer. Pfizer has far more clout than anybody else in the vaccine manufacturing field, followed by Moderna, or both of them are equal. So if you're trying to look for complications from the vaccines, first of all, most of it has been wiped off the internet. Why? Because these companies have enough money and clout to make sure there's no trace about them. So if you try to use Google, for example, to look for the complications associated with the vaccines, because there are more Pfizer vaccines and Moderna vaccines given, you should be able to find more Pfizer complications and Moderna vaccinations on the free internet. You won't. You're going to find more of AstraZeneca because AstraZeneca is just trying to perfect the vaccine that they had to help people, not to hide the realities of the problem that they have. Now, am I saying that Pfizer is good at hiding their problems? I think so, but I'm not gonna delve into that. What I'm gonna tell you is on January 10, 2020, take note of that number, that date, January 10, 2020. Pfizer committed millions or hundreds of millions of dollars or billions to making a vaccine. Now we say January 10. January 10, it's still too early to figure out that there will be a pandemic. We didn't even know that there was an epidemic in China. As far as we know, on January 10, 2020, we were told that there were 41 strange types of pneumonia in China in the first few hours of 2020. 41 cases in the Wuhan wet market related virus infection. Later on this year, we heard a testimony at the US Senate by one of the most brilliant inventors and doctors of our time. I don't want to mention names at this point, who said after they saw this trend, they actually went to the Wuhan market and swapped not only the animals at the wet market, but animals in the bushes and in the surrounding area. Over a thousand different animals were swabbed looking for the exact genome. In other words, the genetic structure of this so-called SARS-CoV-2. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, they couldn't find a single animal in that area to suggest that this was a natural infection that spread from the natural environment. It was a lab generated virus. And so let me take you a little further into this book, this physician treatment strategies. We're not about the book. The book is only on iTunes and Barnes and Nobles. So it's not easily out there. The reason is obvious, Amazon blocked this book when it came out last year. So I did a review and a second edition this year. So what you see on Amazon is really the second edition. So I wanna read something to you on page 40 of this book, okay? The genetics of SARS-CoV-2. And you and I know that the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease last year was attacking people and gaslighting anyone pretty much who said this was a genetically engineered virus. Surprise, right? When his email started showing that it was in prob all probability a genetically engineered virus. This book that I'm sharing with you from was written in May of last year, May 28, 2020, it was published on iTunes and Barnes and Nobles. 
it, that, that's a timestamp on this, right? And what it tells us is this, the SARS-CoV-2 virus may be a recombinant virus between the bat coronavirus and an origin unknown coronavirus. That's the Journal of Medical Virology, April, 2020. What does that tell you? That it was genetically engineered, right? Another article I'm reading from this book, okay? Physician Treatment Strategies. Another article, Jasper Fukwu Chan et al. Emerging Microbes and Infections, 2020, issue number nine, volume one, pages 221 to 236, excellently breaks down the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and is an ex excellent read if you're interested in the genetics of this COVID-19 virus. Jasper's article reports that the S1 subunit of SARS-CoV-2 shares only about 70% of its identity with two bat-like coronaviruses. So ladies and gentlemen, we are dealing with a genetically engineered virus. And if you want more, you can get the book on the items. I wanna leave that alone, okay? When I was looking in January for the little information I can find on what to do, because I'm in the emergency room working as an ER physician, and I was in Louisiana. And as you've seen, the epicenter was New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't too far from New Orleans. So it was of great concern to me that even myself was at risk of death. I'm mm -hmm. not a young kid. I'm in my late 50s. So if I didn't know what I was doing, I was at risk of just getting exposed to COVID-19. And Sandy, you were going to say something. I'm like, no, you aren't. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and so you know, one of the first things I embarked on was, let's find out what type of virus this is. Yeah. And several virologists attest to the fact that this is a genetically engineered virus. And I'm sure most of them have had their funding threatened. Because guess what? The NIH that sponsored Ecolab to sponsor the Wuhan Virology Lab was the one funding most of these virologists, right? So they had to Hey, okay, we're sorry, we published that article. We're sorry, we won't do it again, right? Like a good principle, the NI said, don't do that again, right? So they never published those kind of things again. But here in this book is a guy who doesn't work for either the NIH, doesn't need their funding. And so I was able to write that without any threat from anybody, except some people who try to enter my house without my permission. Ooh. That happened less than 48 hours after I published the book and Amazon refused it and I put it on my website and they intended to enter my house. And I told them if they stepped anywhere near my door again, they'll regret it. This is Texas. And I know this you is would. Florida. This is Florida. <laughs> you know, so, I ain't gonna say what I got. <laughs> yes, so that, that was a conversation and that story I shared in this, second edition of this book. Mm -hmm. So ladies and gentlemen, we have something, a disease that usually when the CDC operates in their fullest capacity, they will tell doctors, the infectious disease experts, what to tell we internists and ER doctors to do. But last year, the CDC never gave any advice except wear a mask. I was so appalled. Oh, bandana. Don't forget your bandana. Yes, but let's start with the basics. <laughs> let's even start with the basics in January, right? Yeah. The head of the NIH, NIAID, knew they had paid some people to generate and create deadly viruses. They knew it. Yeah. And when this thing began to spread, the natural thing was to close down the US borders temporarily, at least for a time, and they refused. And on January 14th, the head of the WHO, Deborah Jesus said, no, there's nothing to worry about. My question to you is, how long does it, or will it take the virus to spread in the US? If, if, they're, you sick, don't? if they're sick, they go to the hospital, right? And then there it goes, poof. And a lot of people were spreading the virus because on, not only on January 14th, but 10 days later, the head of the NIAID, said 
there's nothing to worry about. Shouldn't he have been worried? When you look at the emails, you know he should have been worried. But in spite of that, in spite of knowing that they had paid people to do gain of function studies and that those gain of function studies had been successful, what I want your listeners, your audience to be aware of is that in July 5, 2010, exactly, an institute in London, maybe in collaboration with the NIH or not, filed a patent for a coronavirus based on a genetically engineered spike protein. You can write that down, P-I-R-B-R-I-G-H-T, the Pubright Institute. They filed for a coronavirus patent with extended tissue tropism, which means attaches firmly to a receptor and gives a prolonged effect in terms of its deadly activity. They got uh, approval for that patent. They applied on July 2010. They got the patent in September 9, 2014. And on September, that's a very strange phenomenon that five weeks later on October 17, 2014, the US government, and I have a copy of that three page document, the US government then sent, remember the Pubrat Institute had succeeded in getting a patent for a deadlier coronavirus that they had genetically engineered. Five weeks later, the US government sends out a halt. In other words, a letter sent to all the other labs around the world that they had paid to do what's called gain of function studies. And what is gain of function? If you hear it on the Senate, it means making something deadlier than it is. Something that may only infect animals now infect humans. In this case, the coronavirus that was in bats. I would like to add something that we have to put this out there. Absolutely have to put this out there. Guys, anybody that's watching, we are not politically driven. We, I'm an independent. I like looking at facts. There is absolutely what, what Dr. Pree said in the very beginning. This is factual documentation. There's no fabrication of any of this. He is absolutely just trying to find like answers. Nobody here, I don't know what his affiliation is with, if he's Republican or Democrat, but I am independent. I go by facts. And this is why Nurses Against Violence is around because we, we invoke conversations about factual information. There's things that are out there that are wrong. And this is absolutely like the things that I know from my mom working in the Pentagon, I'm not saying a word, right? but I'm just listening to what Dr. Apri says, and a lot of it makes sense, especially for those of you that have been in the military, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I apologize and please continue Dr. Apri and I appreciate you. No, Cindy, thank you so much. So what I wanna do now is give more factual evidence here. So when they filed for that patent on July 5, 2010, the description, I just have to put a, a small table in the book. So the, they filed for three coronavirus patents, actually, three. The first one was the one I told you I know it by heart, but I'm already looking at it, so I can't say I know it by heart. But so for your audience to know, it's eight eight two eight four zero seven. So that's eight eight two eight four zero seven. Zero seven eight the, four zero seven. So that's one patent. There's another patent, which is nine nine six nine seven seven seven, also filed by the Pubright Institute. The first one was filed by three people. Um, it was um, Paul Britton, Erica Bickerton, and Maria Anesto. The second one, it is also an infectious bronchitis virus spike protein with extended tissue tropism. When you hear that word ETT, extended tissue tropism, it just means a deadlier virus. They made it deadlier. And there's uh, 
there is a component of the terminal chain of a DNA sequence or RNA sequence and the genetic sequence of the virus that's used to make sure that this is a deadlier virus. You know, it's just like spiking the edge of a dart with poison and paralytic agents. So that patent 9969777, 9, three sevens there, was filed on May 1st, 2014, and it was granted May 15, 2018. The third patent that the Pubright Institute filed on coronaviruses was filed on July 23rd, 2015, and it was granted November 20, 2018. Okay, so here's the thing. Most people have never even heard of the name Perbright Institute. Most of the places where I present this stuff, they've never heard of the Perbright Institute, nor of any patent. They just hear about patents. They're not sure. For the general public that's listening as well, what a patent is, is you explain for the coronavirus, why would they need a patent for coronavirus and these different strains? Why would they need that? So that they can commercially, what? take monopoly of anything related to either the production of a test, because you cannot, you know, create a test and patent it without having an organism that you are testing. And you cannot test the organism, except you go to the owners of the patent to what? To get the permission. So they can make millions and millions from the patenting of that coronavirus that they genetically engineered. So what we're saying is, what I'm understanding, yes. that they had this virus already, whatever, if it was made, genetically made, or they're studying something that was made, it was already made and they put a label on it mm -hmm. and they went down to the patent office, which I'm sure is not literally like that, but then they paid for the patent to be able to do testing on it. So and they, yes. make vaccines to that if it ever should come about. Yes. So that's it. But there is more to that. Oh, boy. <laughs> Do we want to go there? <laughs> so prior to uh, this patent, right, there's a connection. And what I want people to do is to begin to connect the dots. Mm -hmm themselves. So if a hundred people are in a room, they can connect the dots and say, this is um, Amadeus, this is Mozart, this is Bach, this is um, James Brown, <laughs> okay, and this is uh, MC Hammer. You can connect all the dots in the sky and come up with whatever you want. But what people are failing to do is connecting the dots. It doesn't matter what you come up with, there is a way when you paint with numbers, right? <laughs> that no matter how bad your painting skills are, if you do the painting by numbers, you're going to arrive at the picture that you're supposed to have. So, and I, I, I need to say something too and ask you a question. So yeah. we, I, we were talking yesterday and, and I said, hey, I'm vaccinated, you know? And we're talking about, and I would love, I want to hear more. I definitely want to hear more, but I have to interject some things while I think sure. about it. Otherwise, sure. I'll forget. I'm a vaccinated nurse. Yes. There are a lot of places that are mandating vaccinations. Yes. What is your take on the vaccination in regards to, and it's up, I believe it's your body, your, you know, your choice, your body, you know, nobody should be giving you an injection. You know, I personally got it. I don't, I don't dictate what you do. So therefore, when we had flu mandation, when we have to have the flu vaccine, we wore a mask. What are we doing right now? We were, we're wearing masks. Yes. So think about it this way. I mentioned in a discussion last year that I was really appalled when I saw a debate between Robert F. Kennedy. I don't know whether you saw that debate last year between Robert F. Kennedy and Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz is this Harvard professor of law, brilliant guy. And what Robert Kennedy was saying was purely American, self-determination and autonomy. Mm -hmm. And last year, 
probably mid-summer when this debate took place or late spring, where when, during the course of the debate, if you read body language and you look at the, so, the direction, Alan Deshowitz resigned. Now he doesn't know about vaccines, right? He's not a vaccine expert, but he was brought onto this debate because it seemed some people had consulted him because they wanted to violate the rights of Americans. So they got a Harvard, and that's my thought here, that they got a Harvard professor of law, asked him how they could violate the rights of Americans and get away with it. But I, what are you really getting away with? You're not getting away, you're destroying the people of that nation, trying to get away with their rights. You're not getting away with anything. Mm -hmm. You're just destroying the country. Yeah. When you say totalitarianism, communism equals totalitarianism. Totalitarianism equals communism. I'm not a philosopher, but I left my country 20 plus years ago because of stuff like this. Because of communism. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not communism. It's just total abuse of structure, infrastructure, and whatever the government had and its people. And then to come here and you see a person who says, I don't want to be vaccinated. And you say, well, you're stupid for not wanting to get vaccinated. You're going to die. Sure, I have insurance. Fine. That's not the case. It's we're going to make your life so miserable till you get vaccinated. When is that America? No. Okay. And it's not. It's anti-American, not even anti-American, but anti-America. This mm -hmm. is not America. And people need to know that. You tell me that a vaccine that was shown in a Pfizer clinical trial where they had 21,720 <laughs> vaccine group subjects, 21,720 and 21,728 unvaccinated people. And so let's look at that clinical trial because that was the pivotal clinical trial that gave people a sense of determination as to whether or not they wanted to take this vaccine. Out of the 21,728 people that did not get the vaccine, that's the placebo group, 99.25% of that 21,728 non-vaccinated subjects did not get an infection. That was a high number. So do me a favor. Just if you could write, read out those numbers real quick to me. So you're saying 20... 21,728 okay. unvaccinated subjects in the placebo group. Placebo, okay. Yes, out of them, 99.25% did not get COVID infection. Okay, and that's a Pfizer study. In that Pfizer study that was published December 10 in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2020. Okay, um, we'll get to you in a minute, Amanda. Um, I will, I will bring this up. So, okay. I'm Based sorry. on those numbers, those mm -hmm. numbers were important in the sense that it showed that the placebo wasn't much different from the vaccinated group in terms of absolute numbers, absolute numbers. Now in the vaccinated group, they said only eight people had a breakthrough infection. Whereas in the unvaccinated group, 162 people had an infection with COVID. So how many of the vaccinated folks get the COVID? You said eight versus the eight, was it the same amount of number? No, of folks? 162 in the unvaccinated group. Okay, and how many in the vaccinated group? Eight. And how, out of how many? Out of 21,720. Oh, okay, so they did about the same numbers. Yes. So okay. one thing that epidemiologists always say, clinical epidemiologists and biostatisticians, <clears throat> and you can use those numbers 
to calculate and even instruct and set exams. But when it comes to public policy, don't use those numbers. They're instructed. Because if you look at the total number, even though you had more people, 20 times more people that got an infection in the placebo group, it's quite likely that since you didn't control the environment, those people may have been exposed to far more infection than those who got the vaccine. That's the first thing. But secondly, if you use absolute numbers, the difference between those who didn't get an infection in each group is important, not just those who got the infection. So if you're gonna use absolute numbers, who didn't get sick in the placebo group? 99.25%. Who didn't get sick in the vaccinated group? 9998 So the difference, the absolute difference between the vaccinated and unvaccinated is 0.73%. So why are they mandating? It doesn't make any sense. Well, think about this. Even if an engineering company thinks that makes sense, hospitals and healthcare personnel should know better. But you can see that, no, critically speaking, critical thinking is gone in most, yeah. <laughs> you know, and many of us are not able to think clearly because we just go to the hospital, we click and click and click. Mm -hmm. We can't even think clearly about what to do for patients. Mm -hmm. And so that takes me back to the primary responsibility of the government agencies. Between January and November, doctors around the world, as early as May, 6,270 something doctors around the world had already started treating COVID patients with hydroxychloroquine. A couple of months ago, I was in Clubhouse and I met a doctor, I'll say Dr. V, for those who know him and have seen us interact in some rooms, who said, I got vaccinated, but I work with the WHO and I work and I'm over 10,000 doctors plus in three provinces in India. And the backbone of our treatment, we do early treatment and it's been extremely successful over 99%. This is the equivalent of a third world country, right? Mm -hmm. And she, he said, or she said, so people can try to figure that out. They're trying to track him or her down, <laughs> that hydroxychloroquine has been very effective. And they also use a bunch of other drugs, ivermectin, um, and a bunch of treatment strategies. And the take home message from that was from January to December, a lot of treatment options were there. The US government had what's called captured agencies. And I'm going to read something from this book, the HCQ debate, right? They said, don't uh, give something that may work. Remember, we are at war, right? Oh, yeah, we World are, War III. We are in an emergency situation. Yep. So if there's truly an emergency, which we know there is, then all holds barred, right? everything on board, which means you tell the doctors whatever you can use to save your patient's life, we'll just keep the data, we'll come back to it to see. No, that's not what was done because they had this thing based on generating viruses on one hand that they were gonna unleash on people and then telling other pharmaceutical companies, get ready, we're gonna make you a ton of money. Mm -hmm. That's not a conspiracy. The evidence, like they say in law, re ipsa loquito, the evidence speaks for itself. Listen to this. The COVID-19 treatment guidelines panel, called the panel, recommends against the use of any agents for SARS-CoV-2 pre-exposure prophylaxis, except in clinical trials, okay? The panel recommends against the use of any agents for SARS-CoV-2 post-exposure prophylaxis, except in a clinical trial. And the 
This is the NIH. It's insane. So, so it's basically like, let them die. Let's, let's just see let how them it is. die because we, this is August 27, 20, <clears throat> all right? Because they knew, and Anthony Fauci himself had filed patents for three RNA vaccines that were declined. And oh yeah, we, I would like to hear a little bit more about that too and about that other famous person too. I'm not saying any names, but yes. yeah, that's pretty interesting. So here we are with the vaccines, but the FDA, right? That's the NIH saying, don't use anything. So even if Tylenol works, Tylenol is basically, you know, analgesic, uh, you know, uh, you know, so antipyretic. And let's say Tylenol, Tylenol works for my patients. The NIH is saying, don't use Tylenol. The NIH is saying, don't use anything. Mm -hmm. Why would they say that? This is a war. During a war, if you really know there's an emergency and you didn't create that emergency, when people are dying and doctors are saying something may work, they're not saying 100%, you know, like the gorilla bouncing on his chest. They're mm -hmm. saying it may work. And you are trying to sponsor studies. And I have a few studies here, several of them, that not only show that they created fraudulent clinical designs to make hydroxychloroquine look like it was ineffective. One of them is called the Bulaware study, B-O-U-L-E-W-A-R-E, -E, a Bulaware study. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in June. And in June, when that study came out, I printed out the study. A couple of months later or weeks later, I went to go back to the study and I typed in June Bulaware and it came out as August. So it was like a moving target. I said, wow. And you know, once things are only on the digital platform, somebody said, that's the matrix. It's easy to twist and change, delete and all that. And you, if you didn't have the original document, you wouldn't even know what has changed sometimes. So the Bulaware study was designed and it's on page 32 of the HCQ debate. Now, if you really wanna know the truth about why some doctors persist and they look like they're morons when they're not with the use of hydroxychloroquine, I recommend that person, if you are that person, that you get a copy of this, the hydroxychloroquine HCQ debate. It's on Amazon. Some of these patients were given lethal doses of hydroxychloroquine. <clears throat> now, when you give somebody whose kidneys are shutting down from cytokine overload, their liver is shutting down from cytokine storm, their lungs are shutting down, unable to oxygenate well. So the metabolic you know, rates are shutting down. The metabolic processes are shutting down. They cannot detoxify those agents that they're getting, right? On top of which hydroxychloroquine has a long half-life, about 21 days. So if you give a normal dose of hydroxychloroquine, it's gonna last longer. If you give what you're supposed to give over five days, over a 12 hour period, you basically multiplied the presence of that drug 10 times during that 12 hour period. So not only if you give that to a normal person, are you trying to kill them? You might kill a normal person, they may have an arrhythmia that may kill them. So to give what you're supposed to give, the FDA said 2.4 grams over five days. You know, FDA won't go wrong on doses. They've got some of the most brilliant people there. So they won't go wrong on doses. But well, here's where they went wrong. The people that did the Bulaware study, the FDA, the NIH often quotes that Bulaware study. And the purpose of the Bulaware study was to see whether hydroxychloroquine can prevent infection. You know, just like the same way they said the vaccine will prevent infection. And what did we find out? The vaccine does not prevent infection. Are we still using vaccines? Absolutely. Hydroxychloroquine did not prevent infection, but it was in that Bulaware study where you could see the first or the second crooked nature of science and scientists that have been tainted. I want to read something to you from that article. Because what this book does is historic in proportion and in magnitude. And years from now, we're going to come back to this book and be ashamed of ourselves 
for not doing the right thing from the very beginning, which was to have critically read each journal, even those that said hydroxychloroquine was ineffective and try to see why was it ineffective. Dr. Opri, I got, um, Amanda was saying a couple things in the chat. She says, that's what's going on in Australia. Um, it's getting ridiculous. They're out there threatening people with no jab, no job. It's despicable. And thank you very much for that. And the second thing that she said, we can't get our hands on any medication such as hydroxy or ivermectin in Australia. People are going bankrupt. We can't even get and we can't even move from one state to another. Some postcodes have restrictions such as not being out, uh, being a, about to leave their home between nine and 5 a.m. Restriction here, restrictions here are unbelievable. And, and that's over in Australia. I mean, this is like, we're international. So, I mean, some of the things that you're saying might be a little different in the United States versus other countries because every country has their own yes. um, things that are happening over there. And, but- the fact of the matter is we have COVID and, you know, and you're telling us some great studies that for people to take and to go and do your own research and do your own knowledge, yes. even though that, you know, the answers, the fact of the matter is, you know, if you want to get vaccinated, that's your choice. Yes. It's and your, vaccination all... can help. It yeah. can help. It can but help. It's not a game changer where it's like everybody is saved from getting the, uh, you know, the virus there's still some chance that you there could be a breakthrough infection. Absolutely. So. And then we're on to, you know, like what you were saying about, you know, okay, so we're going to continue. I wanted to just reiterate that because- Yes, I, mean, I am familiar with the ground rules in Australia. And there's a guy that I listen to maybe once every three, four weeks. He just pops up on my page on YouTube, Alan Jones, that- you know, it's a disgrace, but this disgrace is a result of an agenda-based approach to COVID-19. And there is a gentleman by the name of David E. Martin. David E. Martin. You won't find him on Google. They might have wiped out all his stuff. So you need to go on one of these other websites, maybe Rumble, to hear some of the stuff that he has had to say and he documented these things, patent numbers. And they are a company who finances and have intellectual property capacity where they can look at intellectually filed patents for things in different fields. And they were able to track the coronavirus patents in greater detail than I'm even giving you here. And his point was, there's something called a COVID-19 industrial complex where some investors actually sat down. This is not a conspiracy thing. Just find David E. Martin. Because when things don't add up, you have got find to the do answers. your own answer search. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. In the Bulaware study, let me go back to that because I have to give your audience remedies that they can use, including Australia. Thank you. Okay. 821 adults with household or occupational exposure to a COVID-19 confirmed patient were chosen for this Bulaware study, okay? It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, June 3, 2020. Beautiful design, awesome outlook. <laughs> that will have been the study that proved that the, that the vaccine is no different from hydroxychloroquine, actually. Because when you take my household, I'm not vaccinated yet. I put patients, for those who are nurses, I intubate patients with COVID, all right? I do CPR on them. I run the codes. I put in central lines in them. I put in Hickman catheters in them when they need to be dialyzed for kidney failure, okay? I go into the rooms to talk to them. I hug their families when they're dying. I cry with them. I'm not a scientist per se. I'm a researcher, okay? Scientists do their work, then I research it to find out whether it's relevant to my patient care load, right? So in that study was a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled US and Canada, Montreal, Canada, and Minnesota. It's very easy to remember, M&M, &M, right? Mm -hmm. Minnesota, Montreal. <laughs> Beautiful study. And the goal was to show whether given hydroxychloroquine, right? 
seven different doses than what I use. I use hydroxychloroquine to take care of my patients with COVID. Okay, and I got excellent results till today. And I'm gonna share with you a patient that I call the Fauci patient. I have to call him Fauci patient because I've never treated patients that way. And the patient we're gonna to come to in a minute. But let me share this with you. They said, if you didn't wear a face mask or face shield, that was 87.6%. If you wore a face mask without a face shield, that was 12.4%, 100% in the patients who were exposed, right? In that clinical trial. So they took people who were exposed to people diagnosed with COVID-19. And they said they had to be less than 10 feet away, meaning they were so close to the patient, right? No, less than six feet away. And for at 10 minutes or more, and you know COVID, highly contagious. So if you're less than six feet away from a person and you didn't wear a face mask, and you were with that person for more than 10 minutes, basically you breathed what they breathed. Mm -hmm. So they now did <clears> what? It was a randomized placebo control study. It was a beautifully designed study, but there were several problems. Here in this book, I listed eight problems at first, and then I realized there were 13 problems with this study. Each one of those 13 problems basically invalidated the purpose of the clinical trial, individually or combined. And a few professors of medicine said, this is a nonsense study. Page 32, all the way to page 37 of the HCQ debate. So let's say you went on Amazon, you couldn't afford to buy the book and you say, well, I wanna read page 32 to 37. Please go ahead, the Bulaware study. And the best part is you don't just see the study in this historic book that I wrote last year, you will see the analysis of each clinical trial that I listed here some of which give poisonous doses of hydroxychloroquine. And you could see professors of medicine laughing that, yay, it doesn't work. It's insane. And we're talking May of last year, April of last year, the recovery study in the UK that showed that dexamethasone was effective, for example, mm -hmm. that study gave lethal doses of hydroxychloroquine 9.6 grams, four times the usual dose. And they gave what you should give over a 96 hour period. They give that over a 12 hour period to dying patients with COVID whose kidneys, livers and lungs are already shutting down, unable to eliminate the drug effectively, killing them. And the professors in London, I listed their names. They were happy, you could see they were happy. That's the recovery study. And I usually use this phrase, the recovery study was designed for HCQ patients not to recover. Having said that, the Bulaware study, it was a shame. They waited up to four days after exposure to SARS-CoV-2 on average before giving them the prophylaxis. Now the question to you is, is that prophylaxis or early treatment? It's early treatment. Yeah. But when you look at the study from the perspective of early treatment, then you'll see that hydroxychloroquine was effective in early treatment. So they trick themselves, but they lie to the world. So they didn't give them the medicines on time and then tested 15 only out of 107 patients were tested. Only 15 were tested out of 100, no, 16 out of 107 patients. And then they said, oh, the other 91 patients, we think they have COVID. I have a um, I have a question, and Amanda's asking. Personally, I would prefer medications such as iver ivermectin, et cetera, than the jab. Um, I'm gonna just go through. Alan Jones is fantastic, sticking to to the facts, and she wants to know in particular, uh, does doxycycline uh, make any difference to COVID? I heard it does. I I've seen and I've used maybe one patient with ivermectin doxycycline. But the Bangladesh study, which um, was done on one of the major um, users in uh, Bangladesh, uh, was a doctor who did a study and he had a lot of patients because of the population. And mm -hmm. the fact that once people see something works, they don't have the FDA there who is stifling doctors. 
the doctor, they have faith in their doctors. Um, and so when the doctor says this might work, in fact, ivermectin was used in combination with doxycycline. There's another study where ivermectin was used with carrageenan, twice, two different studies. And you see the efficacy of these drugs, but instead of efficacy here in the US, we see doctors being attacked. Yeah. Yes, doxycycline, not alone by itself. Remember, um, we have a combination of drugs that are so effective. This is the first time in the history of mankind that we actually have a virus pandemic where there's so many drugs that are effective in halting this virus. But here in the US, the FDA says don't use, the NIH says don't use. And let me give you one more trick that was split us. It's called randomized control tricks. The bullet waste study is a randomized control trick, not a randomized control trial. Because when you read through it, and as many others in the book, I, I broke down clinical trials in the book. Here's the deal. When in April 27, on April 27, 2020, when the FDA said, well, we're gonna let you use hydroxychloroquine. It looks like, oh, finally, everybody's been saying hydroxychloroquine can be used. Oh, thank God. Only to look at the regulations surrounding its use. They say, don't use it in stage one, stage two, or stage three. So only use it in stage four. Stage four is a critically ill hypoxic patient who is dying. Now think about this. Hydroxychloroquine yeah. is supposed to be used in lupus, in rheumatoid arthritis at the earliest stages because it's a cytokine blocker. What kills patients is cytokine stump. So you say, don't use it at the early state of cytokine elevation, only use it when the cytokine storm is clouding over the patient with a death sign saying it's time to go home to your maker. That's criminal. That's a crime against humanity. But they were able to get away with it because we're not thinking critically. A few doctors stood up and said, this is a disgrace. But they silenced them somehow. Simone Gold was fired from a job, even though she's a doctor and um, an ER doctor. And a few doctors stood up and said, you can't do that. You cannot dictate to doctors what they can give. You can recommend. And then pharmacies took the law into their own hands and started blocking the, the, uh, the prescriptions for hydroxychloroquine. Some state boards went along with the pharmacists. And so there is a concept called the medical legal complications or medical legal implications of failing early treatment or failing to treat your patients early with COVID. And it's based on this design that if something could have worked for your patient, it's like an oncologist looking at a patient dying and say, well, I'm not gonna give you any chemo. There's no randomized placebo controlled double blinded trial to show that, you know, based on who you are, right? <laughs> <laughs> that this treatment will work, but you can say, doctor, just try for me, right? Mm -hmm. But instead of that, the FDA is saying, when you have stage four breast cancer, don't do anything. That's the equivalent of telling patients in August 27, 2020, do not give hydroxychloroquine. In fact, they didn't say, do not give hydroxychloroquine. They said, do not give any agent. It's there. And then they blocked it from the other side so doctors couldn't prescribe it. Absolutely. So coming back to the real world, right? I wrote that first book because I could see that the CDC that normally provides useful information to ID specialists who we stay on top of the game, but we depend on infectious disease experts, no matter what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So in this, this time around, there was nothing. You talk to ID doctors, they say, we don't know what to do. Wow, this is a strange thing. Even though far back as 2005, Virology Journal published by the NIH showed in their words that hydroxychloroquine was effective in SARS-CoV-1, not only in prevention, but in early treatment. And how come the NIH is not even mentioning it in January, in February, in March? So ladies and gentlemen, there are things you must do or learn how to do for yourself. I'll start with this clinical trial that was published uh, sometime last year. It was a study done in Jackson, Mississippi, okay, by Dr. Hogan. And when you look at this book called A Frontline Doctor's View, why Amazon blocked that book was clear to me 48 hours after I made the first edition free on my website. 
some strange people came to my door. I'm going to leave it at that because I shared that story in the book, not to distract people from how wickedness has taken over the healthcare system in America. So I want to share with you remedy number 10 and remedy number 11, which is on page 68. Uh, Sandy, you're going to get a copy of this book and you're going to get one or two copies for your fans. As Thank a you. So um, this Pepsi is the first thing. There are much simpler things. Pepsi is over the counter, right? Mm -hmm. It's an H2 blocker. And in this particular study in pulmonary pharmacology and therapeutics, um, August 29, 2020, in that article, Dr. Hogan reported their use of Pepsi, famotidine, and cetirizine, which is Zyrtec, in COVID-19 patients. Now, this is not- Zyrtec. Zyrtec and Pepsi. Pepsi. So Pepsi yeah. was 20 milligrams and Zyrtec, Zyrtec 10. 10 milligrams every 12 hours, four, four. doses. Yes. Okay. And it was amazing. You will think that these were like the healthy patients who just had COVID. No, these were patients with severe and critical respiratory symptoms. All right. Severe and critical respiratory symptoms, meaning they were either extremely short of breath, their oxygen levels were extremely low or low enough to require enough oxygen and to be admitted to the hospital and many of them to the intensive care unit. And this patient had an average of 2.7 comorbidities. In other words, hypertension, 78% of them, 42% of them had diabetes, almost 42% had obesity, 26%, a quarter of them had cardiac disease and one fifth were smokers, okay? 16% um, of them had morbid obesity, 10% had asthma. This is not a great group, right? This is a horrible group, but they give them those Pepsi and Zyrtec, the intubation rate was 7.3%. For those who were treated with those drugs, 7.3%. Okay, in spite of the higher comorbidities, ladies and gentlemen, okay? And I can go on. Dr. Mather and colleagues in the American Journal of Gastroenterology 2020, Dr. Friedberg in also 2020, Friedberg et al. These are drugs that are available to be used during a pandemic, which is the equivalent of a war. But doctors are being told by the NIH don't use anything. Now, if that's not a crime on humanity, what is? So what do we do as nurses? What do we do as nurses? Do we stay quiet, Dr. Opri? Um, I think nurses have, you guys have far more class <laughs> than we doctors. Whenever you loud. guys go on a rampage, whenever you guys go on a rampage, <laughs> the world listens. Yeah. The world <laughs> listens. All right. That I'm serious. Yeah. So think about this. A $3 pill or set of pills, less than $3, will prevent, and the mortality rate in that group was lower by about 50% or more. That's just so you can imagine what other drugs are available. Now, when you look at um, itraconazole, was never tried. This has been used in some other viral uh, diseases that were co coronaviruses in animals studies. But here's the thing, for the first time in the history of mankind, we have a viral infection that may potentially wipe out an entire nations, yet we have opportunities to mitigate and stop a pandemic or an epidemic in depending on the locality, right? But the local regulatory healthcare bodies are saying, please don't use anything. What does that tell you? Why would you say, please don't use anything? And why would you say, if you're gonna use anything, make sure it's a clinical trial. Do you think doctors went to school so they can do clinical trials or so they can take care of clinically ill patients? And how many clinical trials, how many doctors are enrolled in clinical trials to take care of patients in clinical trials? How many in the entire US? 
they knew this will hinder a lot of doctors. Mm -hmm. And they did the right thing. They prevented people who cannot think from using drugs that may be potentially harmful, but they did not provide structural support right. for the doctors who knew what to do and were ready to do it. And they could have mentored other people to help them to understand, exactly. hey, this well, is working now and this is evolving and this is a pandemic and this is yes. where we're going to get better. We're going to save lives. And there's a lot of doctors, they have that learned helplessness where it's like they try and try and try and they can't. Well, they don't want their licenses to be called into question. Mm -hmm. For example, I have more than enough justification to make anybody that calls me to any medical board look like a fool if they ask me why I was using hydroxychloroquine. They'll be yeah. too embarrassed. First of all, they'd have to go read the HCQ debate and no doctor wants to look like a fool. And I think that you know, narrative mm -hmm. amongst those doctors do not want to look like a fool is why many doctors are forcing their patients or badgering their patients to get vaccinated because they already got the vaccine. Okay, but let me go further. Ginger has antiviral, anti-inflammatory, anti- What is it again? Ginger. Ginger. Yes. That's also good for the belly. It's yes. also very good for the belly. So that's remedy number six. And let me read something there because, oh, this doctor is crazy. He's gone off the hook. No, <laughs> I am one of the kinds of doctors that if you came to me and told me you were taking ginger or some carrageenan or something at we're just waiting to have you PE seed. A year and a half ago, I will be thinking of how to send you mm -hmm. to a psychiatrist for telling me that you were using garlic, turmeric, or honey, and some lemon for cough. I think something was totally wrong with you. <laughs> okay? Journal of Ethnopharmacology, Dr. Chang, in January 9, 2013, said, ginger inhibited respiratory syncytial virus. So imagine you blend ginger and you give it as a nice tea with honey to yourself or to your child. You reduce the risk of getting RSV. It's been shown. RSV. Another article in the Journal of Phytochemistry by Dr. Samuel, September issue of Journal of Phytochemistry suggests that the multiple chemical compounds found in ginger make it a potential candidate for developing multiple drugs, multiple, not one, multiple drugs due to its antioxidant, anti-cancer, antimicrobial, anti-allergic, and anti-inflammatory effects. June 2013, an article by Haniatka et al. published in Food Function says the immune modulatory lipid lowering, which we didn't mention earlier, effects and anti-diabetic functions of ginger are important. And this is also mentioned by Dr. Ali in the February 2008 issue of Food and Chemical Toxicology. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't know that until I started researching for this book. Little ginger, I see my patients say, doctor, I eat ginger every day. I say, so what? I need to write you this stuff, okay? Yeah. I'm a board certified internist. Lemon peel. I didn't know that. Lemon <laughs> peel has tumor necrosis factor inhibiting agents, flavanones, okay? Uh, Anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory agents. Lemon peel, ladies it's and gentlemen. It's all on the peel. I didn't know that. Simple menthol from Vicks Vapor Rob has eucalyptus oil, menthol, and camphor. It inhibits the virus. When I go into the COVID units, yes, please I share. put that in my nostrils. Okay? When I get home, there's some weeks on end when I'm in the COVID units. I just take a day off of rest. I come back to the COVID units. When I get into the hotel room, I do steam inhalation, put some Vicks Vapor Rub in the steam inhalation in a cup or bowl, put a towel over my head, make sure I don't get burnt by the steam. And some people say, well, you know, you know, you can't use steam, you can get burnt. Listen to this. The Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, when their soldiers or retired soldiers go to the VA clinics and they complain of stuffy nose, one of the recommendations by the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, 
is for the veteran to do steam inhalation therapy. And you know this, a lot of veterans have PTSD, so they could have, you know, you know, recall when they have that steam over their heads, yet the VA recommends it. So if the VA can recommend that you do steam inhalation for a stuffy nose, I'll tell you what steam inhalation does. When you read that book, it increases the mucolysis, meaning the mucus comes up so you can cough it up. Mm -hmm. And there's so many simple little regimens in COVID-19 remedies that can save your life. This so, is Dr. Jackson, yes. So uh, he, uh, so we also got somebody else that is asking what about turmeric? And you and I talked about turmeric as well, didn't we? All right, let me help that person. That's remedy number 13. <laughs> now, 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 you see, this is the book that I feel that's why Amazon blocked it. And I put a picture to show that these guys mean business. I will be, the I'll post the link after this. And also I will be, um, it's very important that nurses are aware of all of this stuff. I mean, you know, medicine came from somewhere, right? Like valerian root. Yes. Valium. I mean, and then a lot of the things that we eat, the, the, the good stuff comes in the peel. Like that's why they say, Oh, eat berries because you can't peel it because the skin is all, you know? So <clears throat> it's, it's important nurses and doctors don't really get that kind of training in nursing and medical school. Yes. So it's very important that, you know, and I love the fact that you bring that out because there's a ton of people out there that when they hear this webinar, they're going to take and they're going to be captivated and listen to everything that is being said. And I know for a fact that what you have said is going to resonate with a lot of our group and as nurses and frontline healthcare workers, it is vital for us to know facts because we get all this misinformation. And if we have the facts, we, I'm not saying we'll be a good dangerous. <laughs> we'll just say that. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, there was a couple, uh, there was a tip that you mentioned about VIX. Now, I may be going back on the floor and you were mentioning, you know, do get some cotton balls yes. and I'll let you. Now, I'll most people are not very good with their hands. So if you're not good with your hands, whereby you can put a cotton ball in each nostril and it's there two, three hours later, you probably suck it up into the back of your nose. Don't engage in that kind of stuff. Don't, yeah, don't don't stick it up there. But definitely, you said use the VIX. Yes. On I do foot. that because I know I can create a ball of cotton bud and rub it with VIX vapor rub and mm -hmm. make sure I put some in my nostrils before I put that cotton bud. And, you know, it's like a valve. And then I wear my N95 over that. Yes. There have been instances where I walked into a room with just a surgical mask and the, the uh, cotton buds, and it's a filter. And it's not just a filter, it's got the menthol, eucalyptus, and camphor that inactivate the virus. And as you're inhaling and exhaling, you're doing something. And one or two more things I'll share super concentrated salt solution. So if you entered a room as a nurse, and this is important for nurses, if you entered a room and you got exposed, you know, you probably inhaled a little, you know, then get super concentrated salt solution. Spray it down each nostril. And if you can find a spray to put the stuff that you've created, the super concentrated salt solution, don't inhale it, just spray it. If you can't, then get a swab like you're swabbing yourself for COVID-19 and dip it, make sure it's mostly salt. in the salts solution, the mm -hmm. solution, and put it through each nostril as if you're swabbing yourself. You notice that we initially were swabbing for COVID-19 testing, the throat and then the, um, the nostrils. And then it turns out that you got more results with the nostrils. So we left the throat and went to the nostril. And if only people do some critical thinking, you say, why? It means that there must be a reservoir, right? Mm -hmm. Where the COVID-19 just sits down and yeah. takes its time. So yeah. if you attack that with the super concentrated salt solution, you did something phenomenal for your body inactivating the RNA or any other DNA or any other viruses that were there by 
spraying or making sure you just pass that super salt solution across each nostril. There is um, somebody also mentioned, I know that we both have to get going because we have another engagement that we have to be on. Um, there was uh, something that was mentioned to me about like the tonsils and how it all like the infection can kind of like stay in there. So what do you have like? As yes. So there are two parts to the saline. That's the easiest part. The most important part that I found out for myself, because I'm exposed to this patients in both the ER and the ICU and even in the hospital, is to gaggle. So the super concentrated salt solution that you're making is not just for you to put some in your nostrils, it's to gaggle. When you gaggle with it, you wait about five minutes. I'll tell you what happens with me. It may not happen with you, but it probably will. Once you gaggle, and you're done, you know, by law of gravity, some of it is going to start going down your throat, right? And then you wait for about five minutes and you'll feel the phlegm start coming up. What you do then is you cough. Don't be a gentleman, mm -mm, mm -mm, no, <laughs> cough it up. In fact, there's one of the remedies in this book is coughing it up. Yeah. Remember remedies are what your doctor won't tell you to do or use Often that you breathe. must. Cough it up and speed it out. Cough it up and speed it out. You do that. You may do that for an entire hour. Ooh. It's okay. Remember that stuff that could have gone down your lungs. Yeah. No, that's so true. When you do that, as uncomfortable as I mean, you just speed it up, cough it up, speed it out, cough it up, speed it out. And then you rinse your mouth. After you've rinsed your mouth after five minutes, it doesn't matter. The job has started. And the amount, people are surprised at how much stuff was there that would have just gone down their lungs if they didn't cough it up. And that is a good stimulant. And you use another thing you can do is hydrogen peroxide gaggle. There's something called a gaggle study that was registered last year and they refused to do that study. I think they knew the outcome of that result because hydrogen peroxide is very effective for me. Um, and my wife has tested several times because she went to travel internationally. So she's my spouse. She should be COVID-19 positive. Three tests, she's negative. And I'm home with her, coming back from, in fact, the last time she went to Nigeria, it was four days after I came back from a COVID um, unit that was there for about seven weeks. And I was supposed to have uh, been quarantined, but once we knew what to do and the remedies, we stopped this 14 day, seven day quarantine. I said, baby, you can punish me, but is it really necessary? And she said, okay, I'm not gonna punish you this time. And it works, it works. So. Um one last thing, um, I'm seeing something about monoclonal antibodies. Now, again, we're talking about remedies. Yeah, we're talking we're talking about remedies, but we're also talking about a pharmacological Treatment. remedy. Yes. Right. Yes. And it's a great thing. We've got well down in Florida, we have people laying on the ground in agony. There's overflow in a lot of these hospitals, as you know. Yes. And um he said, uh, Amanda's asking, Amanda, I'll respond in just a moment. Uh, hydrogen peroxide and um, very super concentrated salt water. I would imagine the water is warm. Yes. And um, so, but yeah, monoclonal antibodies. They work. What, they what do work. Think? Okay. But remember this. One of the things I came to conclusion about is monoclonal antibodies were um, approved, I think, late September. October, think about the cost. Yeah. This COVID-19 industrial complex, which I think your listeners and the audience should try and read up and Google David E. Martin. They will find crazy amount of evidence. And if some of them are influential, they're gonna be instrumental in bringing people to justice because mm -hmm. that's needed. This yeah, is a crime absolutely. against humanity. So they are effective. But think about it this way. I design a virus and I say, hey guys, I got the virus, I got the patent. You guys go ahead and start developing stuff. We're gonna give you access to a lot of good stuff. We're gonna allow you to make a lot of money. It wasn't necessary, it was overkill. When we had SARS-CoV-1, we didn't have vaccines. We stopped it. You know, and I have to add something. And I'm sure maybe if anyone out there has a cat or a dog and they go and get them, you know, there's a COVID vaccine for animals that was around before the vaccine came out. So it wasn't something that they just 
came up with. No, no, no. They had it already out there. It wasn't something they got in the witch's brew and said, ha, 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 this might be it. Yep, that's the right one. No, you know. And co- um, mRNA vaccines have been around. And when you read about, uh, listen, if it was a video you saw about David Martin, the entire details, you'd see that this was in the making. This was not some conspiracy, forget the conspiracies. When you look at the facts, for example, the guy who was a computer guru, who one of the richest guys in the world, no names mentioned. If you know him, you know him. <laughs> paid this pub right institute. You know him. <laughs> he paid this pub right institute $186,000 one year, then $386,000 or $387,000 another year, less than half a million dollars. But right after coronavirus began to spread in November 2019, and this is a great coincidence, this uh, foundation paid $5.5 million to this institute, the Pub Rights Institute that I mentioned earlier. And the question you ask is, wow, you never give these people up to half a million dollars. And they filed for a patent for the coronavirus, got three patents. And then around the same time when the virus began to spread like crazy, they get a check from you for 5.5 million. How do you explain that? Well, they're not related. And I agree that they're not related, but it's a fact that still ought to be mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, One last thing, hydrogen peroxide. I think there's only one kind, right? No, there's food grade and there's a regular. What? So so the food grade is (laughs) 0.5%, all right? I did not know this. (laughs) You know, there's, there is um, one of my ambulance drivers, one day I told him, I said, what do you think about hydrogen peroxide? That was last year. You know, they transport all these COVID patients. And he said, oh, I use food grade. I said, what is food grade? He said, that's 0.5%. <laughs> I said, okay, but the regular one you see in the brown, sh- brown yeah. bottle, that's 3%. So I use, you can just use that one on the shelf, 3%. Okay. You get more bang for your buck, okay? He uses... <laughs> the 0.5%, which is food grade. And it's more expensive to use a food grade. Okay? Uh-huh. So just hydrogen peroxide for the count is what I use. And it's 3% versus 0.5. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I really appreciate you coming on. <laughs> you have been so instrumental with knowledge and given and you fed the nursing community and we appreciate so much you. from you know that you've done. And I'll put links in. So if anybody is looking into getting the book, and the, which books are they called? It's the, I have it here. I, um, it is. I'm going to repost those links to you so that you have. Yeah, I would really appreciate the that. The yeah. hydro, the hydrochloric, I can't even. The hydrochloroquine H- debate. Yeah, I can H- never H- say H- that word. Uh, debate. And then the other one was the, um, the treatment. COVID-19 yeah. remedies. Yes. Remedies, yes. So we'll, I'll make sure those are in the, the feed and, and everyone's saying thank you so much. And, you you know, I appreciate you and I I look forward to working with you more. Yes, same here. Thank you. All right. Have a good day, guys. Thank you.